What is it that man does not control yet? Time. We have learned to measure time precisely, and we have analyzed and studied it in our most profound philosophical reflections. But all our studies have not helped us to control something as simple as giving birth when the conditions are most appropriate, or remaining in a death-like state for years and reviving when life is possible. Man does not know if time is real or if it is an entelechy. It could be that we live so fast that we can't feel it anymore. We're satisfied just seeing it pass by. Other living beings seem to have a closer relationship with time. Many of them have very precise and amazing inner clocks that they can advance or delay at will. It's likely we stopped listening to those clocks thousands of years ago. It seems to be the time for the kites here on the Okavango River. We've been traveling around Namibia and Botswana for weeks, and we haven't seen any of them before. But all of them are here. We don't understand the reason for such a mass grouping, but it's clear these kites are waiting for something. In just a few seconds, the air filled with reasons. The reason was that out of the thousands of termite mounds, winged princesses and males began to emerge in search of a new kingdom. It's their moment. It's the appropriate time to mate and to start new termite mounds. The right temperature, humidity, and sunlight have triggered their hormone timer. But undoubtedly, the strangest thing was why these kites were there. They were waiting for them. These birds have come exclusively to feed on kings and queens. They have synchronized their timer with the insects. They knew the time and place for their yearly appointment with the termites. And the kites were right on time. Their efficiency showed that this was not the first time they were on such a hunt and that they were not there by chance. In less than an hour, the termites had stopped flying up and the kites scattered again all over the territory. We didn't find them again. There is no man-made computer with enough parameters to parallel the accuracy that rules the skies at the Tropic of Capricorn. The natural ability to wait is as precious as knowing how to hunt. And being on time is not an exclusively British virtue. In England, as in any other part of Europe, natterjack toads show their good manners, especially when they have a date with the ladies. Contrary to popular belief, Many amphibians spend most of their time in dry and even arid places. They only come to the water once a year, when it's necessary to mate. Their appointments are scarce and short. They only meet for a few days. And each time the appointment must be set previously, so all of them can attend the party. In the two previous years, the appointment was for January 31st and February 7th. Things have changed a lot this time, especially regarding the atmospheric pressure and temperature. This year, the toads will arrive at the ponds on April 24th. The weather has gone crazy. However, having to wait is not habitual among toads. In this society, nobody arrives early or late. Genetic breeding among the best is at stake.
The males were the first to arrive, as it should be. They loudly proclaimed their superiority. They will spend one or two weeks croaking, waiting for a continuous line of females to approach their noisy pond. At night, directed by a weather station that analyzes weather, temperature, and humidity, the ladies come to the pond. Just for a day, for a few hours, and they'll spend only one night with their chosen mate, their warty knight in shining armor. After a long embrace that may last 20 hours, they won't visit any other pond until next year, when their calendar and inner clock tell them that it is the perfect date for egg laying. show an almost paranormal knowledge of meteorology. They always know when it's going to rain or when it's going to be sunny. In fact, some weather forecasts are based on watching how some living beings behave. Sometimes their appearance is the most trustworthy indicator of a change in environmental conditions. for example, are excellent weathermen. They usually wait for a storm to pass over to send their winged hordes to spread and reproduce. After the rain, the ground is softer and the females find it much easier to dig their nests. Therefore, it's most important to synchronize a breeding flight with a heavy rain. In a society of ants, soldiers and workers are not sexually defined. Only winged members are males or females and are the potential future queens and prince consorts. The raising of winged ants is controlled and timed precisely so that all of them mature at the same time. That way, they will have the most possibilities to have a successful mass fecundation. The precise agreement on time minimizes their exposure to predators. It's not easy to attack on so many fronts at the same time, and this ensures the survival of the greatest number of winged ants. The secret order that tells the ants when it's time to emerge from the ground is usually valid for many ant nests within the area, independent of their species. However, some other nests are not synchronized. It's likely that the reason for this lies in the form of another defense mechanism for the species. Man cannot accurately define the factors that trigger these procreative orgies. The accurate ants do not get confused. In fact, their behavior has made them one of the largest zoological families in the world. The so-called ant explosion happens once or twice a year, and it only lasts for a few minutes. After less than half an hour, nobody is left except one or two fertilized females that lose their wings and begin to dig their nests. <laughs> 